Hi, and uh, welcome back. Uh, today, unfortunately, we have to leave behind the 18th and 19th centuries, which were so much fun. And we have to enter the 20th, which is far less so. And we do it through World War I, which is really far more important, I think, than many realize today. In light of World War II and the Holocaust, and especially for Jews, World War I is really the great divide in European history. It separates the so-called long 19th century of bourgeois society, the age of liberalism and positivism, from the age of mass society and mass politics. And in some ways, 1870 to 1914, you can think of it as a sort of Indian summer of bourgeois Europe. It maintained its hegemony, while the forces undermining it gained momentum. Socialists on the left, extreme nationalists on the right. They could not gain power before 1914, but these forms of mass society are coming to fruition during and after World War I. After World War I, the parties of the radical left and the radical right the parties of this new type of mass politics are going to come to power, and the short 20th century is going to be marked by unprecedented violence and war between these radical ideologies. It actually begins during the war itself, obviously, right, with the Russian Revolution, and then it's followed by other left-wing revolutions throughout Europe, all of which ultimately fail, uh, including one in Germany. Uh, the first labor government is formed in Britain in the late 1920s, and 36, a left-wing popular front takes power in France. And on the right, you have Mussolini in Italy in 1922, Hitler in Germany in 33, and a host of other fascist and authoritarian governments in the 1930s, Spain, Portugal, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Austria, and, and more. And the emergence of mass society really transforms the Jews. And we're going to spend, after World War I, the remainder of our course looking at examples of that. First, in the Soviet Union, we'll take a look next time at a society based on an ideology of class and what that means for its Jews. Then we'll look at interwar Poland, including Galicia, as a part of interwar Poland, on a new society based on the idea of nation, which will be absolutely transformative. And finally, of course, there's the new society set up by Nazi Germany of based on race, and we'll take a look and we'll end with the Holocaust. Today, we're dealing with the war itself, and that is coming in several parts. First of all, just talking a little bit about the Eastern Front. That's really the focus of history courses. Usually the Western Front gets a lot more attention. But the Eastern Front for us will be much more important, obviously, than Galicia in particular, Jewish autonomy in the Ukraine, Congress Poland, and finally the Russian experience. So really we're going to take a tour of all of Eastern Europe. And we're going to uh, start talking about the revolution in Russia today, the civil wars and so on, but really continue it next time. And this is a narrative of violence. Uh, it's a narrative of violence above all else. And it's one which is going to leave the Jews... Uh, the surviving Jews in uh, a world of different regimes than the one they inhabited beforehand. So let's start with the Eastern Front. World War I is an absolute calamity for the Jews of Eastern Europe. Never before in modern history had the inherent vulnerability and weakness of the Jews as a scattered minority been exposed with such insistent brutality and impunity. The Pale of Settlement in Russia, and especially Galicia above all, is a battlefield. And on top of this, throughout the war, but especially in the immediate aftermath, beginning in 1918 through 1920, Jews are going to suffer innumerable pogroms of far greater intensity than anything they had previously experienced. Millions are displaced, hundreds of thousands are killed, injured, or orphaned, the local economy is destroyed, and mass homelessness results. And if you consider also the millions slaughtered in the trenches of Western uh, Europe and the fronts and the trench warfare, and on top of that, the experience of the Armenian genocide in Turkey. The experience of mass death and mass murder does a lot to prepare the psychological ground for the attempt to wipe out the Jews entirely two, days, two decades later. During the war years, the single most important fact to keep in mind is that the Jewish population of Europe is residing in areas that become at one point or another a major theater of war. And this is exacerbated by the retreating Russians' tendency to repeat their uh, sort of tradition of scorched earth uh, policy of, of the, from the Napoleonic era already. Uh, the three great multinational empires are collapsing. Uh, the Russian, the Austrian, and the Prussian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, for that matter, are collapsing. And the civil wars that are going to rage throughout the region uh, are going to have a huge impact on the Jews as the various nationalities compete to establish their new states. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Lemberg, Lvov, Lviv. Austri Austrian, of course, at the outbreak of the war, conquered by Russia in September of 1914, reconquered by Austria in June of 1915. The defeat of the Central Powers in 1918 brought bloody battles between the Polish and Ukrainian armies in the winter of 1918. 
finally incorporated into independent Poland, but only after a frenzied pogrom of three days that killed 72 Jews and wounded 443 others. Or Vilna. Vilna is Russian at the outbreak of the war. It's captured by the German army in September of 1915. It's part of independent Lithuania at the end of 1918, Soviet Lithuania in January of 1919, reconquered by the new Polish army in April of 1919, reconquered by the Red Army in August of 1920, which delivered the city to an independent Lithuania, but then the city was overrun and annexed by Poland in October of that that year. Or Kiev, Bolshevik uprising in January of 1918, suppressed by the forces of the Ukrainian Rada. In February of 1918, it's conquered by the Red Army, in March by the Germans, in December taken over by the Ukrainians, in February 1919 again taken over by the Red Army, in August by the men of Petlura's Ukrainian army, but then later Denikin's volunteer Ukrainian army, two different Ukrainian armies, then in December by the Soviets for the third time, then the Poles occupied the city in May 1920 before the communists finally recapture it for good. Jews are generally accused by all sides and all armies as traitors, as armies are going back and forth over these areas. The Austrian and Germans generally gave them uh, somewhat reasonable treatment. Uh, Often, in in some cases, they hoped to use them as a sort of Germanizing agent. And the Red Army, led by Leon Trotsky, almost universally avoided pogroms. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, during the Russian Civil War, actually, the vast majority of Jews, who were certainly not communists, but they had no choice but to support the Red Army uh, because it was one of the only East European armies that didn't commit uh, anti-Jewish atrocities. Other minorities suffered as well, no question. The Armenians, most obviously. Also the scattered German minority that's living in Eastern Europe. But Jews suffered more than any other East European group, without a doubt. Jews are time and time again singled out of the civilian population as the target Uh, of attacks, especially during the Russian Civil War, and partly because there were so many Jewish communities, uh, all culturally distinguished and virtually defenseless, Uh, but also because they were feared as actual or potential threats to the victory, as we'll see as we go through the Civil Wars. Uh, The oppression and brutal expulsions by the Tsarist army in particular led to about a million Jewish refugees by the end of 1915 alone, as we see. And the worst was yet to come, because with the military defeats, the subsequent revolutions, and the political fragmentation of the various multinational empires, you have the collapse of orderly government in Eastern Europe in 1917, 1918, and the Jewish community will just fall, the Jewish population, I should say, will fall victim to wave upon wave of of pogroms, indiscriminate slaughter of Jews, climaxing in 1919, when the civil war in Eastern Europe is raging at its fiercest, um, and it it will, again, we'll come back to this as we go through the various regions. Uh, It's not only traditional inter-ethnic hatreds dividing the Poles, Ukrainians and Russians and Jews, but also the highly dangerous, conspicuous role of some Jews in the Bolshevik leadership. The fact that guys like Trotsky and Zinoviev and others cut themselves from their Jewish backgrounds doesn't prevent a popular mindset that describes the communist regime as a Jewish conspiracy against the Christian nations. If you want to define that, you could find it. Uh, Never before had the expression, beat the Jews and save Russia, an old expression, made such obvious sense. As the various Ukrainian, Polish, and anti-Bolshevik, the so-called white armies, crisscrossed Ukraine, pogroms increased in number, and eventually tens of thousands, maybe as many as 150,000 Jews are killed. And world Jewry, for all of its imagined power, and as we'll see, there was a lot of imagination about the power of world Jewry, they really couldn't do much. Coordination between the various countries was cut off by the war. Stadtlanut lobbying was hampered. The British, for example, didn't want to offend their Russian allies. Uh, And besides that, your generals and civilian leaders often lost control of their soldiers. Only in America, neutral until 1917, could Jews do much. And even there, they were afraid to act for fear of domestic anti-Semitism or making things worse for the Jews of Eastern Europe. Um, They could, and they did, try to rally at least for relief efforts, although distribution could be tricky. German German Jewry did it for occupied Poland. The British tried to do it for Russian Jewry, but it was really American Jews, three million strong by World War I. With the benefit of neutrality and uh, a decent amount of wealth, uh, they really could shoulder the biggest burden. In November of 1914, they established the famous Joint Distribution Committee, Felix Warburg's heading it, to coordinate all their efforts overseas. And they're really able to work on both sides of the front, even to Palestine. Tens of millions of dollars distributed during the war years and just after 
saving uh, countless, li literally from, from death. And often it was quite dangerous with the breakdown of order. Uh, Israel Friedlander, an historian and an activist from America, he's actually killed himself. He's killed in a Ukrainian pogrom in 1920 during the distribution of, of the aid. And the aid obviously has a political po component. There's a political fight for control on the American side, but there's also a political fight for control on the distributing end, on the, on the East European side. Um, the politics of controlling these things is, is quite important. Uh, German, Russian, and Turkish authorities, by the way, not to mention the British, uh, all had to allow this to happen. And they did so for their own reasons, either because the relief made them look good or because of their belief of Jewish power. Uh, the most important thing really was this perception. These, these empires really thought that Jews were quite powerful, especially in America, and they all hoped to sway America to join the war on their side if only they could feed, be beneficial to the Jews. This notion of international finance led by guys like Jacob Fish or the press led by the Salzburger family and so on, this leads everyone to contribute in their own way. So Russia, for example, despite all the persecution that we'll see, they abolished the Pale in 1915, partly to entice America to enter the war on their side. The Ottomans restrained forces who want to expel the Jews from Palestine for fear of America entering against them. Uh, when British issued the Balfour Declaration in 1917, declaring their intention to establish a Jewish home in Palestine, also their uh, decision to create Jewish units in the British Army led by Jabotinsky, this is all designed to appease the Jews, excite the Jews, and get them to persuade America to enter the war on their side. And even the Jewish role at the Paris Peace Conference um, and the League of Nations uh, declaration that the purpose of the British mandate in Palestine was for Jewish home, all of this was because of this perception of Jewish power. So let's start by taking a look at Galicia. And if you look on the screen, actually, the, the title of Battle for Galicia, that's actually a game. Uh, shockingly, there's, there's a board game created on the Battle for Galicia. But for me, I included it not only because I happen to love board games, but also because it's symbolic of the moment for me. This is really going to mark the end of Galicia, in a sense. None could see it yet. The battle for Galicia wasn't just the battle to control Galicia. It was the battle for Galicia. Would Galicia survive World War I? And it would not. But that was the battle going on. Um, Galician Jewry, like all Austrian Jewry, was hyper-patriotic in 1914, all excitingly looking forward to the de defeat of Tsarist Russia, which they considered to be the greatest enemy not only of Austria, but also of world Jewry, and here the work of Marshall Rosenblatt is really quite important. Uh, they, I want to re remind you of how they adulate Franz Josef, Ephraim Yosel. They adore him, genuinely so, and for good reason, because that was really the best defense of their rights and their safety that, ever, that really ever existed in that area. Um, unfortunately, quick Russian victories in 1914 led to the occupation of most of Galicia by the Tsarist army, and the literal and metaphorical rape of its population by Russian soldiers. Legally, Galician Jews were equalized with the rest of Russian Jewry, expelled from all municipal go government, expelled from the countryside, their civil rights withdrawn, uh, schools and synagogues are being closed, public meetings banned. All of this was not just incidental. It wasn't just out of anti-Semitism. Actually, it was a fundamental aspect of their annexation of Galicia. Ending the Habsburg character of Galicia was represented and affected by the end of civil rights for its Jews. It ends its Habsburg character, it ends being Galicia and becomes part of Russia. And Galician Jews were anyway especially suspect as traitors because they were genuinely loyal to Austria. They genuinely mourned its defeat. They genuinely prayed for its victory and return. And almost every Russian unit, upon entering a city, harassed and robbed the local Jews, as did the last units to depart it. Pogroms, some lasting days, took place, and the Russian army even took hostages and executed civilians as collective punishment. Plus, you have war operations, which are generally cutting off the province from any outside help. So the assigned reading for today from Ansky, uh, it's been translated into English as the enemy at its pleasure, but the original title is The Destruction of Galicia, Chorben Galicia. Chorben, which is the word used later in Yiddish for the Holocaust, for the genocide. That's what Ansky was able to imagine. Here's what he writes, for example. From these and other dismaying reports, we realized that things beyond human comprehension were going on in Galicia. 
a vast region of one million Jews who only yesterday, under Austrian rule, had enjoyed human and civil rights, was trapped in a cordon of blood and iron. Severed from the rest of the world, they were at the mercy of Cossack and Russian soldiers, provoked like wild beasts. It was as if an entire people were perishing. Now, that's going to happen only 20 years later, that entire destruction. Quite literally, Glacier will see at the end of our course, unfortunately, suffers the highest rate of destruction of anywhere in the world. That hasn't happened yet, but yet it was. There was an, uh, a real qualitative and quantitative spike in destruction, and it seemed like the end of Galician Jewry. And in some ways, it was the end of Galician Jewry. Uh, Galicia wasn't severed from the world, per se. It was severed from the Habsburg Empire. And the Habsburg Empire was the wall that had protected them. Galicia, as a province of the Habsburg Empire, was the wall that protected them. And to be sure, tens of thousands of Jews perished. Hundreds of thousands more faced absolute economic destruction. Some 340,000 refugees, the vast majority are Jews, pouring into Hungary and Moravia and Bohemia and especially Vienna, whose population grew by 50% where the native Jewish population tried to deal with this refugee crisis as best as, it's co as, it, as it could. And the region was reconquered in massive battles in 1915 and the Jews proudly took part, actually. Uh, Marshal Rosenblatt found uh, memoirs where in newspaper articles where people discussed Jewish soldiers gleefully reconquering Galicia, some wearing their tefillin or carrying them with them. In other words, symbolically combining their Jewish pride and their Austrian pride reconquering Galicia. On the other hand, as Russia left, over 50,000 Jews were expelled eastward with them, with the retreating armies. And here also we have a very disturbing eyewitness report from an American girl at the time living in Kiev, Ruth Pierce, and here's what she writes to her parents. Before dawn this morning, I was wakened by a shuffling noise from the street. It wasn't soldiers marching. There was no rhythm to it. Marie and I went to the window and looked out. Down the hill was passing a stream of people, guarded on either side by soldiers with bayonets. I rubbed the sleep from my eyes to look more closely, for there was something ominous in the snail's pace of the procession. They were Jews waxen-faced, their thin bodies bent with fatigue. Some had taken their shoes off and limped along barefooted along the cobblestones. Others would have fallen if their comrades had not held them up. Once or twice a man lurched out of the procession as though he was drunk or had suddenly gone blind, and a soldier cuffed him back into line again. Some of the women carried babies wrapped in their shawls. There were older children dragging at the women's skirts. The men carried bundles nettled up in their clothes. They stumbled and pitched along as if they had no control over their skinny bodies, as if another step they would all suddenly collapse and fall down on their faces like a crowd of scarecrows with a strong wind behind them. Some of them some had their eyes closed, others stared ahead with their faces like dirty gray masks with huge bony noses and sunken eyes. The procession showed no sign of coming to an end. It crawled on and on, and a stench rose from it that poisoned the morning air. The sound of the shuffling feet seemed to fill the universe. Where are they going, I whispered to Marie. To the detention camp here. They come from Galicia, and Kiev is one of the stopping places on their way to Siberia. Do they walk all the way here? Usually. Let's shut the window and keep out the smell. Despite the reconquest by Austria, which is temporary, as we'll see, most refugees remain and do not return. And for those who do return, they find their homes in ruins, the economy collapse, and a kind of frightening anticipation of the post-Holocaust years most Jews' property had been seized, and few were welcomed back, uh, where anyway basic su survival was in question. Russia rallies in June of 1916, drives Austria out of much of eastern Galicia and Bukovina, including Tarnopol, Buchach, and Chernovitz. They try to push even further in July of 1917, but they're stopped and repulsed by the German counteroffensive, which pushes them out for good. And as the war ends, both Poles and Ukrainians are going to court the Jews for support. Poles declared their opposition to anti-Semitism and their desire for the assimilation of the Jews. Ukrainians declared that Jews could never become Ukrainian and support national autonomy for the Jews. There's an irony there. The, the, the notion that, of, by the Ukrainians that Jews are not Ukrainian actually in this case was spun to defend their own national autonomy, which of course the Poles would never tolerate. As late as October of 1918, when Austria sues for peace, it was thought that President Wilson could be satisfied with a restructured Habsburg Empire based on autonomy. Uh, Wilson issued his famous 14 points, which are the conditions for peace in, at the end of the war, and one of them 
demanded national self-determination, and they had hoped to satisfy that point here. But on October 21st, Wilson declared that the emperor's decision to restructure the empire based on full national autonomy for every nationality wouldn't be enough. Every nationality would have to be free to decide its own fate. And this was the signal for the bloodless collapse of the Austrian part of the Austrian Empire because no one was prepared to fight for its survival except for the Jews, of course, who mourned its defeat for many, many years to come. And following the fall of the Habsburg monarchy in November of 1918, the Jews of Galicia became caught in the Polish-Ukrainian War. In purely Polish West Galicia, there was no problem. Jews supported the new Polish regime. That was quite easy. But in Eastern Galicia, Jews, and especially Zionists, declared themselves strictly neutral in the Polish-Ukrainian War. It was the only safe option because they didn't know who was going to win. And anyway, they assumed the battle lines would move back and forth for quite some time. It would be quite dangerous to have chosen one side over the other. In the meantime, the old assimilationist leaders of the Jewish community, recognizing mass support for the nationalist cause that we saw in an earlier lecture, they resigned from their posts. Jewish nationalist leaders then formed local Jewish national councils throughout East Galicia, which they dominated and which takes over the administration of the communities. And Ukrainians generally accepted Jewish neutrality, at least until the breakdown of authority in 1919. But the Poles did not. And in 1918, Polish soldiers start perpetrating numerous bloody pogroms. Jews respond with self-defense units, which are denounced by the Poles, uh, ironic, you know, not ironically, but denounced by the Poles and tolerated by the Ukrainians. Um, and in the, in the short run, they do protect some Jews, but I mean, it's not like they could fight off the entire Polish army. Uh, there was a brief, short-lived central government of the Western Ukrainian Republic, i.e. Eastern Galicia, in the few months that it was controlled uh, by Ukrainians. They were actually prepared to grant the Jews full national autonomy, uh, but in any event, it was quite short-lived, and it was overtaken by the Polish army on November 22nd, 23rd. Following the occupation of Lviv now by the Poles, there was a series of pogroms, 72 Jews killed and 443 injured in Lvov alone. And here again, we have a report that's worth reading for a moment. Lemberg uh, writes, this is a report from the Neufeuer Presse in Vienna. Lemberg was one of the most tortured, most horribly tormented cities during the World War. It had to endure the alien Russian conqueror marching drunk with victory through the streets. But the full misery of unleashed unrestraint broke over Lemberg only when the country's own children turned their weapons upon one another. When Poles and Ukrainians struggled over the possession of the city with grim hatred, a century old, centuries-old national rivalry. Last Friday, the Poles succeeded in mastering their adversaries and hoisting the red and white flag upon the towers of Lemberg. This victory was celebrated by a three-day pogrom, three pogrom against the Jews. Hundreds of men, women, and children stained the streets of Lemberg with their red blood. Three days during which, in this great, densely populated city, the seed of important authorities, the site of a centuries-old historical culture, scenes were played out that would have brought eternal shame and disgrace to any remote, God-forsaken provincial town of the Russian steppe. And notice this strong contrast with Russia. It's an important part of Galician identity. Galician Jews and Galicians in general saw Russian Jews as this disenfranchised, persecuted, and oppressed group in contrast to themselves. And they saw themselves protected by their father, Franz Josef. And that's the language of the quote, right? The children of the province, of devoid of their fatherly protector, left to murder each other. You know, 1908, a single murder, the assassination of the governor of Galicia, shocked shocked people by its unimaginable barbarity. Now, Galicia seems farther away than ever. Galicia, which had been this bulwark against barbarity and anarchy, this borderland against the East, it was over. Now anarchy ruled. And by the summer of 1919, the armies of Poland had captured all of Galicia. It would spend all the interwar period inside the new Polish state. And between 1910, say, and 1921, the overall population of Ju the overall Jewish population of Galicia decreased by about 20%. And this is the end of Galicia in a manner of speaking. Logistically, it's, it's the end of Galicia as a, as a political province, as, as a crown land, but also the end of Galicia in other ways. It'll live on. It lives on in identities. It lives on in cultural differences, memory, mythology, the myth of Galicia, mourned by Jews more than anyone, but very quickly when people discover what was to come, mourned by other people as well. But the end of the war means the end of Galicia, Habsburg province, the end of the Habsburg Empire. Let's talk about some of the other areas. 
First of all, Ukraine, meaning east of Galicia, Ukraine. 60% of Jews in the Russian rule were living in the Ukraine. And after the February 1917 revolution, Ukrainian nationalists, remember that was the first democratic revolution before the Bolshevik Revolution, Ukrainian nationalists formed a central Ukrainian council called the Rada, which is pushing for autonomy within a democratic federal Russian state. Uh, calls for complete independence were already being heard. In January 1918, the Rada proclaimed the separation of Ukraine from Russia. The Jewish masses in the Ukraine didn't regard this new state with such favor. They didn't have any strong affinity to Ukrainian culture. The image of Hemelnitsky still dominant, believe it or not. And Jews tended anyway to regard themselves as being an important part of Russian Jewry as a whole. So in order to secure the support of the Jews, the new Ukrainian state makes a historic agreement with a cast of Jewish leaders, mostly Zionists, also some socialists, to grant national minority rights to the major minorities in Ukraine, including the Jews. And during this period, Jews are represented in the Rada with 50 delegates, including a minister of Jewish affairs established in July of 1917, and a law based on personal national autonomy for national minorities penned for the, by the first minister for Jewish affairs, Moses Sibelfarb. Um, Personal, nas personal national autonomy means no matter where you live, you are a part of the broader national minority and you can achieve certain benefits and so on. A Jewish National Council was formed in November 1918. Uh, a provisional National Council for the Jews of Ukraine was convened. And the Jewish ministry passed the law calling for democratic elections to the administrative bodies of the, community, of the communities in December of 1918. But already that's going to be moot because of the collapse of the, of the country. In fact, autonomy was really abolished already in July of 1918. The ministry was dissolved and pogroms began to break out. Uh, critics say this was just a ruse. The Ukrainians never intended to offer long-lasting autonomy to the Jews, but it's not clear if, if that was the case. It's, it's a question, but it's moot in any event. And pogroms break out around the summer of 1918. Um, until that time, the Ukrainian state had basically been held up by the German Empire, when German support collapses in November, the state's going to fall. Uh, Simon Petlura, who is a socialist nationalist leader, not an anti-Semite, establishes a provisional government to protect the independent Ukraine against its many enemies, especially, of course, the Poles on one side and the Russians on the other as part of the Russian civil war beginning to rage. And in February of 1919, he's chairman of the government and chief commander of the army. With the retreat of his forces before the Red Army in 1919, uh, pogroms begin to break out. Some 1,300 pogroms ultimately happen from all sides, Ukrainians, Poles, and the various Russian forces, leaving something like 100 to 150,000 dead Jews, many more wounded, orphaned, destitute, and so on. Petlur himself does little to stop the wave of mob violence, and he's later going to be held responsible in the Jewish popular mindset, at least for the Ukrainian pogroms, and actually, he's going to be assassinated in 1926 in Paris by a Jew named Shalom Schwarzbad. And, and actually, Schwarzbad is acquitted, which is quite interesting. As, uh, as one of my teachers once said to me, if you're going to assassinate a political leader, a really good place to do that is Paris, because you're unlikely to be convicted. He did it in broad daylight and turned himself in, and yet he was acquitted. Uh, it was considered justifiable in their mindset. In any event, the entire experiment, which had basically fallen apart in late 1918 with the pogroms, was finally destroyed in August 1920 when the Red Army completes its conquest of Ukraine. There is a lasting impact in Jewish history beyond the political footnote, however, because of the cultural effervescence that erupts during this period. The moment Sibelfar was appointed Minister of Jewish Affairs, he sets to work organizing departments to deal with education and culture, establishing, for example, the Kultur League or the Cultural League, of which we'll speak about a little bit later. Let's first of all move on to Congress Poland. Extensive German-Austrian conquests in Russian Poland, Lithuania, not to mention Galicia, in the summer of 1915, brought approximately 2.3 million Jews, almost half of Russian Jewry, under the military rule of the advancing armies freeing them from Tsar's depression, but separating them from Jews who were remaining under the Tsar. The Germans become bogged down in the West in trench warfare. They begin to move east and establish client states, independent Poland, independent Poland in November of 1916, independent Lithuania in February of 1918. And German rule, it was military, it could be harsh, but it was at least stable. 
And based on the principle of equality before the law, in fact, they were the first. They were at first particularly keen on winning Jewish support. They imagined Jews, Yiddish-speaking Jews, as being a potential Germanizing, <clears throat> Germanizing agent in the Slavic area. They soon abandoned this idea. They preferred to establish a client uh, Polish state, but for a while they were encouraging it. And as government agencies were increasingly uh, turned over to the Poles in 1917, 1918, Polish Jewry would turn its attention to working with the Poles rather than the Germans. And the same thing happens in Lithuania, despite the fact there's a firm Lithuanian majority in, in Vilna. The most important impact of the period, and again, like in Ukraine, was that the new political freedom leads to an awakening of social and political movements on a scale previously unknown, especially the freedom of the press. Yiddish is specifically recognized as an official language by the Germans until 1917 at least, and the freedom of the press was tremendously influential. The foundations of all the great Polish-Jewish uh, uh, parties of the interwar period were really laid now during the years of German occupation, and as the Germans reorganize the Jewish community, they're almost encouraging Jewish political activity, and Polish Zionism in particular, for the first time, emerges a powerful, independent force. And it was especially helped by its leadership role in running relief work, which is going to play a, a tremendous uh, role in Russia as well. The breakthrough to positions of power throughout Polish Jewish communities had a lot to do with their effective and energetic response to the challenge of Jewish economic distress. And this includes establishing schools for Jewish children whose education had been interrupted by, interrupted by the war, and schools which obviously would tend to have a Zionist orientation. As Germany and Austria Hungary face defeat, the inevitable emergence of a Polish state grows clearer. It was explicitly one of Wilson's points. In November of 1916, Germans established a temporary council of state, which is made permanent in September of 1917, and Jews welcomed this patriotically, and relations at first seemed promising. Uh, the council of state met until July 31st, 1918. But things quickly fell apart. Uh, the promising relations uh, begin to deteriorate, and the rebirth of Poland in 1918 was greeted with waves of anti-Semitism and pogroms throughout Congress Poland, West Galicia, not only Lemberg, but throughout Congress Poland also, and West Galicia, even though the Jews in, bo in both Congress Poland and Western Galicia had enthusiastically accepted Polish rule and, and celebrated the, re the reconstruction of the Polish state. Uh, uh, Jews really suffered from the vacuum of power. So you have pogroms, for example, in Kielce and Lvov, that we've already talked about Lvov, but there were many other pogroms throughout the region besides the massive wave of, wave of violence in Ukraine, 1919, 1920. Um, and, you know, Pilsudski, he's going to come back, the Polish leader Pilsudski, we're going to come back to him another time. He meets with Jewish leaders, they demand he, he stop the violence, and he gives only empty promises. He's simply not willing to do what it takes. Uh, there was an attempt in late 1918 to begin to organize Polish Jewry, Zionists, Folkists, Bundists, and others, not the Orthodox, but the modern Jewish parties, they meet to form a provisional national council in Warsaw and to organize for the first Polish parliament set for January for elections in January 1919, and we'll speak more about that uh, with our class in interwar Poland. And finally, we come to Russian experience, to the war in Russia. And here there's two parts. We speak about the war in Russia and the impact of the Russian revolutions. From July of 1914, much of European Russia and the entire power of settlement falls under virtual martial law. The civilian population, Jews and non-Jews, are subject to erratic requisition policy, to price fixing, interference with the move movement of goods, to concerted efforts against smuggling and so on. And the use of German, Hebrew, or Yiddish was restricted and later actually banned even in private letters. The war's first months found most East European Jews in conditions of rapid economic decline, deteriorating still further in the wake of the ferocious attacks on Galician Jews by Russian troops during the invasion of that province. In these tense times, various groups and individuals, German merchants among them, of course, were subject to suspicion of treason, but rumors concerning Jewish treachery were especially pervasive and convincing. The Jews' use of Yiddish, which resembled German, their traditional association with smuggling, their supposedly festering resentment of Russia, leading, it was assumed, to a pro-German sympathies, and even their higher level of literacy, making them suspiciously well-informed about military affairs, all strengthened an already highly charged anti-Semitic 
atmosphere. In short, the Jewish question, which has been so central to the Russian state and society since 1881, grows even more central during the war, particularly after the defeats of, by the Russian army on the Eastern Front. The Tsarist government seeks to explain them away by blaming traitors, disloyal to Russia, chief among them the Jews. And the Tsar really was convinced that there was a Jewish fifth column conspiracy, despite the fact that the Jews really were serving in the Russian army. Between 1914 and 1970, some 600 or 650,000 Jews wore the Russian uniform. 100,000, by the way, died in the uniform. A higher percentage than the proportion of the population. And just for the sake of comparison, some 320,000 Jews wore the Austrian uniform and 40,000 were killed in that uniform. Finally, in the spring and summer of 1915, uh, 500,000 Jews throughout the Pale on both military fronts were expelled from their homes and sent into internal exile, branded as spies, forcibly evacuated because of the possible harm they might cause once the area was conquered by Germany. These refugees were given often an hour or two or a day or two to pack up and leave their homes, Vir virtually no notice whatsoever. And even when rail transport was provided, which wasn't always the case, it was sheer chance that determined their final destination. Refugees are transported without proper provisions and often appallingly unhygienic conditions. And even when the roads become hopelessly clogged, impeding essential military transport, the policy was considered too important to cancel. In August 1915, when Jews were temporarily allowed to leave the Pale, the horrific crowding of the urban centers becomes somewhat alleviated. But then, of course, relief work becomes more difficult and expensive because they're all over the place. Some Jews are as far away as Siberia. All in all, taking into account the Galician refugees, by the end of 1915, about a million Jews had been made homeless, crowded into Krakow and Budapest and Vienna, Vilna and Moscow, and innumerable other urban centers, both inside and outside the Pale. And there's obviously a lot of other random uh, and somewhat organized violence as well. Violent attacks were made in the Jewish population uh, throughout these areas. Jewish leaders seized as hostages for the political loyalty of the Jewish population. False charges trumped up, alleging Jewish aid to the enemy. Innocent Jews often sentenced by court-martial to be shot. Uh, the government, at this point, 19, July 1915, prohibits all correspondence in Yiddish and imposes a ban on all publications printed in any Hebrew character. This affects the population of millions, the vast majority of whom know no other language. At the same time, though, the same thing we've seen before, the same thing we saw in Ukraine, the same thing we saw in Poland, the same thing we're going to see in Poland again. The persecutions and expulsions of the war stimulate an immediate renewal of activity among the Jews to help the refugees expelled or fleeing, and that's going to have consequences. Even the authorities were forced to recognize the need to support these groups. For example, as I said, temporarily lifting the ban on Jewish settlement outside the Pale in 1915, Jews even permitted to enter educational institutions and to establish their own institutions in inner Russia. For Russian Jews, relief work becomes the most obvious priority across the political and social spectrum. And this was quickly coordinated through the establishment of a new body called the Central Jewish Committee for the Relief of Victims of War. ECOPO is the Russian acronym. Organizes large-scale activities in conjunction with the Jewish Colonization, Colonization Association and with the aid of the Joint Distribution Committee and without a doubt saved hundreds of thousands of Jewish lives. Transport and medical care has to be provided. Once relocated, they have to be registered for future aid, housed, provided with information about family members who are separated, and when, and when possible, put to work or supply with some kind of monthly subsidy. Children need to be schooled, unemployable adults retrained, and so on. And this body is handling sums of money far greater than any past Russian Jewish organization. In its first year, it raises 1.5 million rubles from Russian Jews alone, whereas ORT, for example, the 19th century uh, charity organization to help uh, Jews in Russia, was running on 75,000 rubles during 1914. Initially, government support was not forthcoming, although in 1916, the Minister of Interior does recognize the body as the address for future Jewish leadership and, and does and supplement its funds somewhat. Its most important impact was that the thousands of relief workers who spread throughout the province 
many of them were young and radical in thinking and effectively replaced the old communal leadership who simply didn't have the resources to deal with the crisis. You know, Russian Jews are unified under a single overarching communal body in a way that hadn't really been the case since the Polish partitions in 1772. Communal workers of every class participate in this activity which awakens the feelings of national unity within the masses. And this body serves to politicize many men and women who would otherwise have shunned modern politics. Many Jews in the period are introduced within the context of Russian Jewry's extensive relief programs to liberal and left-wing platforms, ideas, and slogans for the first time. And this awakening stimulates all types of Jewish bodies to revive their activities in other fields. These pent-up forces within Russian Jewry only needed a political change in order to renew their social and political activity with even greater vigor. They only needed an opportunity to express themselves, and that change comes with the February-March 1917 revolution, the Democratic Revolution, which we'll talk about for a few minutes before concluding. In early 1917, the situation of the Jews was desperate. You can imagine the feeling of really almost messianic relief when the Tsarist regime finally fell in the Russian Revolution in February-March 1917. In the eight months following that revolution, constitute a springtime, a very brief, ephemeral springtime in the history of Russian Jewry. It's, you know, when Tsarism falls, one of its first acts of the successor government, of the provisional government, is to abolish all legal restrictions on the Jews. Uh, all the, this is a quote, all the limitations and the rights of Russian citizens imposed by hitherto existing laws on the basis of religion, creed, or nationality are hereby revoked. Boom the end of the autonomous community, the end of all Russian Jewish disabilities in one fell swoop. And this was followed by an extraordinary political and cultural efflorescence among the millions of Russian Jews, unprecedented and short-lived. It's going to be crushed within a couple years, but so, so pervasive for that short time. Jews who have been oppressed for so long are suddenly freed and their energies are overflowing in many directions. I mean, there's almost a state of terror and messianic expectation and deliverance from oppression. All of a sudden, this explosion of energy giving impetus to this independent Jewish activity. As soon as the revolution breaks out, mutual aid societies begin to call for a national congress of Russian Jews, as similar to what happened, by the way, during the first revolution, Russian Revolution, 1905. And by now, most Jews basically agree that the Jewish people of Russia constituted a separate national unit whose national rights must be secured. The same transformation had more or less happened in Galicia as well. All of the spokesmen of the Jewish parties saw the future of Russia as a federation of free nations, enjoying autonomy within the wider political framework, and the main debate centered on the precise form and limits of national autonomy, the links with other sections of the Jewish people, you know, the borders outside the borders of Russia, that is to say, the, lim the attitude uh, towards the Zionist idea, I mean, are we going to support an independent Jewish state in Palestine or not, and so on. Um, Zionist and religious groups dominate the election to this first Congress, mainly because others boycott it. And the Zionist influence goes even stronger once Britain issues the Balfour Declaration, which swept Russian Jewry to a peak of enthusiasm. The beloved ch charter that Theodor Herzl had longed for, the, international, the charter by the international power that actually controlled Palestine, which was going to uh, de dedicate itself to a Jewish home there, you can imagine the messianic swooning that was going on in Russia at the time. Socialist influence also quite strong, uh, particularly uh, because they had close ties to other national political groups. And, and in general, the Jewish political parties are just awakening after years of imposed silence underground. Socialist parties like the Bund and Pole Zion, Zionists, even the religious camp, Orthodox parties, are flooded with new members, redrafting their programs, establishing new branches, institutions, embarking on a wide range of activities. Uh, most of them agreed the first essential uh, activity has to be a nationwide Jewish Congress uh, to figure out what, you know, how they would represent Jewish demands to the state and so on. There's also a sudden flourishing of journalism and publishing in Russian, in Hebrew, and in Yiddish. The establishment of a comprehensive system of Jewish education through kindergarten through seminary. You have the Kulturliga we mentioned once before, which was established by Sybil Farb. It's initially designed just for... Uh, to uh, uh, relief effort for the pogrom victor victims who, you know, they need to be sheltered and fed and clothed, but quickly becomes more about 
culture, the Kulturliga. It's set up by Jewish literary men, uh, young Jewish literary men, and you know, organizing children's homes, public schools, high schools, evening classes, and later even a seminary and an art school. There's a printing press and a studio. There's 230 branches in Ukraine alone by 1920. There are two powerful forces opposed to this vision of a federal Russia granting autonomy to all of its peoples. On the one hand, you have the separatist ambitions of some nations, like the Ukrainians. They do not want a federation of all nationalities. They want an independent country, which doesn't, doesn't work for the Jews, but it works for them. And then there's the centralizing tendency of the Bolshevik party itself. Uh, gradually, uh, in theory at least, will recognize the right of various peoples to national autonomy, but it's going to typically restrict this um, to people who inhabit definite territories, which means not the Jews, at least in theory. Uh, the Jewish parties are going to support the Ukrainians at first, hoping to keep them in the Russian Federation, and as we saw, that's not going to work, um, and the Ukrainian state will, will attempt its own autonomous state. Once Ukraine is defeated by the Red Army, Ukraine will be forced to be co-opted into this new Soviet Union, and the Bolshevik rulers will crush this political awakening and cultural fluorescence of the Jews and of, eventually of the Ukrainians as well. Uh, all, all of this is going to be squashed. I mean, first by the Russian Civil War, uh, and, and then later by the Bolshevik Revolution. We're going to see how that goes next time. Some words of conclusion. The First World War brings an end to a hundred-year period that, in retrospect, can be seen as something of a golden age, I think, in the history of the Jewish people. That's how I began class. What fun it was to talk about the 18th and 19th centuries. Prolonged internal peace and economic growth, barely interrupted, permits the population in Eastern Europe to increase many times over. Liberal immigration laws makes it possible for millions of Jews to find new homes overseas, so Galicia will live on in the emigrate communities. Jews are granted equality everywhere in the West and in the East, in Galicia at least, not in Russia of course yet, but at least in the Galicia and in everywhere in the, re in the West. Anti-Semitism is on the rise, but it seems to be in control at the outbreak of World War I. War utterly disrupts all of that. Death and destitution destroy hundreds of Ju thousands of Jewish lives. They are accused en masse of first of disloyalty and then of Bolshevism in the various East Central European states precariously surviving in the border of the Soviet Union. The Jews find themselves at the mercy of whatever armed unit was, uh, it was occupying them at the moment. And after the war, these accusations stick. In general, they tend to stick, and anti-Semitism will reach unprecedented proportions even before the Holocaust. And all of this was happening just as the escape routes to America were closed in 1921 and especially 1924. Jews find themselves, in some cases, refragmented. Soviet Jews, for example, are cut off from the rest of, of world Jewry. In other cases, reorganized. Polish Jews will see united for the first time in 150 years. Galician Jews, Congress Jews, and some Prussian Jews reunited for the first time in 150 years. And this refragmentation, reorganization is going to lead to a lot of economic crisis for the region as a whole and for the Jews in particular. You know, uh, at least 200,000 Jews uh, will remain stateless refugees in East Central Europe. It's a new category, a new category, stateless refugees. And finally, Jewish-non-Jewish -Jewish relations will be poisoned at both the local and government level, level in unprecedented ways, both because of the new hyper-nationalism, which is going to be based on ethnic criteria that excludes the Jews from, from inclusion, but also because of the very real Bolshevik threat, which will be uh, associated with the Jews as, as, as the embodiment of that, of that threat. But having said all of that, it was catast a catastrophe, an unprecedented catastrophe. It destroyed all of that. But the war also ends with hope of the realization of the political dreams of all forms of modern Jewish politics. All forms of post-liberal Jewish politics, whether organized liberalism, which was the goal of most Central European Jews, especially Germany, for example, or Zionism, or socialism, or autonomism, all of these seem validated in the aftermath of World War I. So, for example, organized liberalism seems to have made its day in Weimar Germany, a true democracy for the first time. Zionism's greatest success comes with the Balfour Declaration, that Britain, who controls Palestine, is going to 
uh, be midwife to a Jewish national home there. The Russian Revolution, and the Bolshevik Revolution in particular, seems to give hope to Jewish socialists that the, their, all of their suffering, all of anti-Semitism, all of this will be solved in this new classless utopia. And for the autonomists, for the Jewish nationalists, including self-described Zionists who are basically diaspora nationalists, all of their hopes and dreams seem to come true with the national minority treaties that all of the East Central European states, especially Poland, were forced to sign. The dream of the Bundes and the autonomous uh, were forced upon these states by, at the Paris Peace Conference because of the goal of Wilson of national self-determination. So overall, World War I brings anguish. There's no question about it, and destruction and transformation. But it brings also the seeming realization of Jewish political programs. And with these causes for optimism, most people assumed the worst was behind them. Uh, the League of Nations, Balfour Declaration, Emancipation, Physical Safety, Extraordinary in the Soviet Union, and so on. And the belief in Jewish power had made many of these gains possible. Uh, the, Brit the British, for example, issuing the Balfour Declaration in order to entice America to enter the war. But few people realized the reality of weakness that the myth hid would be a source of untold danger. None of these, of course, you all know, none of these would come to fruition. In none of these places would their dreams be realized. Uh, Britain would end up closing the gates to Palestine. Poland would never honor those treaties, and so on. And one last point about World War I in terms of its connection to the Holocaust. I don't want to be teleological. Nothing is inevitable. The Holocaust was not inevitable. World War II was not inevitable. People make choices and so on. But in terms of understanding how people could make the choices they made and how the Holocaust could come about, I want to make one final series of points about World War I. There are aspects of it that I think were important leading up to the Holocaust down the line. Number one, the psychological preparation for mass murder and the concept of ethnic cleansing, the experience of mass violence, of millions dead, whether the trench warfare where you see unprecedented casualty levels in single days, weeks, and months in these massive battles in the Western Front or in the Eastern Front, the massive levels of death and, and murder happening, um, or for that matter, the ethnic cleansing that comes out of the Armenian Genocide. These concepts are new and unprecedented, and they have now entered the mindset of humanity in a way that I think is quite important. Uh, number two, the experience of Western, especially American Jews, coming in after World War I and reconstructing the war. You know, uh, during the war, there was a lot of propaganda about Germans, and there was a lot of news going on about what was happening in Eastern Europe. And when the war was over, they got in there and they realized, my God, this was horrible. All of these people killed and all this destruction and so on. But they pour in money as best they could, and they rebuild Jewish life as best they could. So during World War II, a lot of American Jews thought the same thing was going to be happening. Yes, we've heard about this, this terrible destruction, but after the war, we'll come into Poland or whatever, and we'll pour in this money, and we'll reconstruct Jewish life. They had no conception of what was coming. They might have tried to work differently if they had. And finally, um, not that American Jews could have stopped the Holocaust, but just to keep that in mind, and finally... Uh, the role of, of anti-German propaganda uh, beyond even Jews because there were all of these lies made up about the Germans during World War I, and there were. There, were, there was insane propaganda about uh, German behavior during the war that simply wasn't true. So when news of the Holocaust is leaked out in 42 and 43 and beyond, a lot of Westerners, not just Jews, but the, but the governments as well, imagined this to be propaganda, and they didn't realize at that point that uh, it was not propaganda per se. It was actually happening in that case. In any event, we now leave behind World War I. We've entered the 20th century, and we're going to be looking ahead to a comparative focus, first looking at the interwar Soviet experience, a new society based on the, the ideal of class, and then looking at the, at the interwar Polish Jewish experience, including Galicia, uh, and a society based on extreme nationalism before we lead towards World War II. Thanks a lot.